1 Samuel chapter 30, and the title of the message this morning is simply entitled, We Are Not Just a Get by People. How many know in the world around sometimes you can get settled, and it can happen in the church as well, to where we just get settled to get by? How many have ever been there? How many say, I wish I hadn't been there, and maybe I've been there more times than I wished I had, but how many know there are answers because God has called us as his people to be more than just a get by people. Amen. First Samuel chapter 30, we're going to begin reading at verse 1. Now it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south. And Ziklag attacked Ziklag and burned it with fire. And had taken captive the women and those who, who were there from small to great. They did not kill anyone but carried them away and went their way. So David and his men came to the city, and there, it, and there it was, burned with fire, and their wives, their sons, and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were, were with him lifted up their voice, voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. How many know that's some strong, strong crying when you cry to the point that you physically begin to give out, and there's no more power or strength in your body to cry another tear? And David's two wives, Ahonim the Jezreelitess and Abigail the widow of Nabal the Carmelite, had been taken captive. Now David was greatly distressed. How many know everything that's in the Word of God is there for a reason? Every word. And so it wasn't just that David was distressed and was going through something. He was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. How many know when things get tough you find out what's in you? Look at somebody around you and say, when things get tough, you find out what's in you. And when things got tough, it wasn't that David was the great man of God that God had his hand on and that he was ready. And the people were saying, a boy, they spake of stoning him because they thought he was the problem. Because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. If you don't have that underlined in your Bible, I sure wish you would today. But David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to Abiathar the priest, to Himelech's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Ab Abiathar brought the ephod to David. So David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, recover all. Look at somebody and tell them, God means for you to get it all back. God's desire is that you get it all back. We've been looking in previous weeks, last week in particular, and how God puts his church together. Jesus is the head of the church and how he has called his church unto him to do a work in the earth for his namesake. And how that God puts us together by connection with him and with one another and the things that he's called for our lives, for our families, for our church, for our areas of business, ministry, and everything that God has given us. And as we look at the pages of the word of God and we see God's word, how many know we don't just want to look at it, we want the word to come alive to us today? We're asking that the Lord, the Word, become flesh and dwell among us. And just as they saw Him 2,000 years ago, we want to see Him through the pages of His Word as He walks into our life and makes sense of everything that's happened. Yes. Amen. And we live by His Word. Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How many know when we have problems and we do, we have to hold on to the Word of God? Your opinion, my opinion, your thoughts, my thoughts, they amount to nothing if they're not anchored in the Word of God. How many know what we need is the Word of God on every matter we're dealing with, everything we're facing? We must have the Word of God for the matter so we're standing on solid foundation that cannot change, cannot weaken, cannot fail, cannot lie, will never leave, will never forsake. God said, you stand with me and my promise is I'll stand with you. But how many know that's going to come through the test of time? So we see with David that David came to Ziklag 
And everything that he had to that point in his life, he found that the enemy had stole it away. We understand from last week that we looked that there's a difference in Saul and David. Saul being a type of the flesh, David being a type of the spirit, David being a man that God said, he is a man after my own heart. Saul was not a man after God's heart. God so, spoke of Saul and said, I've removed him from being king. And we, we looked last week at some of the things that Saul encountered in his life, got into his heart, the way he lived before God and man that disqualified him from doing the things God had called him to do. How many know there are things that we can do in our life if we do not allow God to get us out of it and it out of us can disqualify us from doing things for the Lord? Because sometimes we're not healthy enough to do the things that God's called us to do. And there are season, seasons of having to get healthy enough to do what God's called us to do. So David was in a season where that he was tested and everything was in him and about him before God took him to the place that he had called him to go. He had to go through some stuff. And he was going through stuff that Saul had not taken care of. And we looked last week about how us individually and our marriages and our families and our grandkids and business and ministry and everything we do, whatever daddy and mama dealt with, their mom and daddy dealt with, their mom and daddy dealt with, and even not just naturally but in the church world spiritually, if it's not in Jesus and we don't deal with it, the devil will seek to use anything that's outside the Lord to detour, delay, or destroy our destiny. So we are a people of God that have to be responsible and be accountable to walk before the Lord and one another and do what the Lord says in obedience unto him that we may fulfill his purpose and plan. So we're not a law to ourselves. We're not an island to ourselves. When we were born again, something happened and we were born again. We belong to the Lord and we're walking in this earth around us and God has called us in his church to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature because God has a purpose us for my life and yours. Amen. Let's look at somebody if you wouldn't tell them God has a purpose for you. Nothing you've been through has taken God by surprise. Nothing you will ever go through takes him by surprise. But the question is, is how do we pick up the pieces of what we've been through and what has been in our history and our heritage before we were even born into the earth? Because how many know the devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That the Lord told us you resist him steadfast in the faith. So how many know we got some work to do? We got some rebuking to do. We got some binding to do. We got some loosening to do. We got some work to do with the Lord to stand in our authority and command the devil no place in our lives so we can move forward in the Lord receiving from him of every good thing. But how many know if church is a game to us or we don't take seriously the things of God and we're not di disciples, dis disciplined disciples, disciplined ones that are walking before the Lord with an understanding of vision and clarity, then we can end up wasting days, wasting months, wasting years and one day look up and say, it's way, way far gone. But can I tell you, I don't care where we are today, if there's strength in our bodies to look up to the Lord and call out to him, there's hope for the future and God's desire is to recover all. Yes. Amen, somebody. If you believe it, say, Lord, I thank you that you've called me to recover all. Yes. Nothing taken, nothing stolen, nothing happened. You've called me to recover all. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, what we need to do in our lives is get down into the understanding of the authority and the order of God and how he's working in my life and yours and how he works through the church individually and corporately so we have an understanding of why we come to church. Why we're in a community of believers and why we do what we do so that we have clear testimony to be able to share with the world around us. This is why you need to come to church with me. This is why you need to get you a home church. This is why you need to get a connection that you know God has built in your life and it's by the hand of God and you honor it and you respect it and you take care of it and you won't let the devil destroy it. Yeah. 
Because what God does in our lives, he does through connections. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11, And he himself, talking about Jesus, gave some to be apostles, and some prophets, and some evangelists, and some pastors, and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Do you see that he's saying there's work to be done in our life? From the minute we're born again until the time we see the Lord face to face, he is doing a work in our heart, our mind, our life, our families, and we are tied to him and we're tied to one another as he's called us to go forth in the earth to do what he's called us to do. Look at somebody, if you wouldn't, say, I need you. Look at somebody else and say, you may need me. We need one another. That we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. How many know there's a difference in childish and childlike? God said, I don't want you to be children acting childish, walking around like you don't know, like you have no understanding. I want you to grow up in me and enjoy every good thing that I have for you. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies according to the affecting, effective working by which every part does it share. Somebody say, do your share. Somebody say, do your share. Causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. How many know when we begin to see through God's word and God brings his word into our heart, the engrafted word that we get within us, we begin to think different. We begin to believe different. And we begin to live different. How many know when you look at somebody and you say, do different, but there's no thinking different, there's going to be no different. How many know before there's ever a change and we get where we're going, there has to first be a ready mind. There has to first be a place that we look before the Lord as he shows us what is the right and what is the wrong. What needs to be taken out and what needs to be placed in. And God's word, we renew our mind with his word and we get his word down in our heart and we begin to believe different, we begin to think different, and we begin to live different as we put these principles of God's word in place. Amen, somebody. So how many know it makes a husband a different husband? How many know it makes a wife a different wife? It makes a daddy a different daddy, a mama a different mama. It makes a marriage different. It makes a family different. It makes the kids different. It makes everything different when we are submitted unto the Lord, the head of his church, and find out how we walk with him and walk with one another and begin to walk out and do the things he's called us to do in our authority but under authority. But how many know, just like in the world, if we get God's people coming to him, receiving their salvation, but not learning and getting in the word as to the authority and the order and the structure of a life, of a family, of a church, a business, a ministry, how many know we can love him and want the good things of him, but never fulfill that in our lives because we don't know what to do? So how many know we got to learn what to do? How many went to kindergarten and first grade and you learned what two plus two? How many know if we hadn't done that, we wouldn't know it? How many know the things of God require humility? Because if we're not humble enough to sit under those fivefold ministry gifts and allow God to feed me, I'll live without it. The anointing we respect and honor, we'll receive from it. The anointing we disregard and dishonor, God will not be able to get to us what he wants for us. Just look at Jesus when he walked in the earth and there were some that received and there were some that did not because they did not honor him. Now how many know in the church God said, I have given the gifts. Jesus said those fivefold ministry gifts and I gave them so the church could grow up. But we have to find that in our life and what God has said to us about where we're supposed to be, why we're supposed to be there and get submitted planted, anchored, and under the authority of the Lord, in the order of the Lord, walking with him day in and day out, 
or else we will not be growing up in him. And how many know we're going to see that in our life? How many knows it matters what we do? It matters where we go to church. It matters who we sit under. It matters where we say, I don't sit under there. I bless them, but that's not where I'm called. It matters what God is doing in my life and what he's calling for me and what he's calling for you because we'll either be obedient to it or we will not. But if I'm married, I'm married to one woman. And that's where the commitment's at. I'm not looking out and saying, well, you know, it's complicated. It's complicated. No, it's not. It's really not. You're either married or you're not. Put your ring on or you don't have it on if you're not married. But if you're married, you should have your ring on because it's not complicated. You're married. Amen, somebody. And in that same covenant in a marriage, I'm either married or I'm not married. When we walk with the Lord, we're either in or we're not in. But what God wants to teach us is how to get in, stay in, and work through what you got to work through, go through what you got to go through, and get it done His way so we can grow up in Him and do what He's called us to do. And can I tell you, we live in a world where everybody wants to make many places excuses and talk about why there is not absolutes. And how many know God is a God of mercy and grace and it's the only reason any of us can stand? But how many know there is truth? And there is absolute truth. And if we hem haw and dilly-dally around and act like truth is not truth, you will stay stuck. I will stay stuck. And there needs to be something deep down on the inside of us that when somebody tells us the truth, we don't get mad about it. We get glad about it no matter how I'm feeling and say thank you for the truth. Because there's coming a day that the Lord said that there's going to be people that are in strong delusion that God allows to come. And God said they would be caught up and taken away with it because they did not have a love for the truth. Jesus, the Word, the precious Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. And they're matters of truth. And how many know we're supposed to be a people that's committed to the truth? To him, to his word, to the leadership of the Holy Spirit and wherever matters of truth are at because it's only the truth that's going to make us free. Amen, somebody. Look at somebody, if you wouldn't tell them, say, God's sending truth your way. Look at somebody else and say, God's sending us some truth. And then he watches how we handle it. Because will we honor truth? Will we accept truth? Will we embrace truth? Will we engage in truth? Will we humble and bow before truth and say, Lord, change me. Do whatever work you need to do in me and show me how to live and follow you and get the victory and recover all. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now in the church, not my father's house, this was 2,000 years ago, at Antioch. But how many know that church was standing before the Lord and operating, just like we're standing here today before the Lord and operating? Now the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So is it important to do what we've been called to do in the earth that somebody recognize it by the Holy Ghost and that somebody lay hands on me and you and set us forth and send us to the work we're called to do by the Holy Ghost as he does it through the authority and the order of his church. Yes, 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 yes. Look at somebody and say, none of us are an island to ourselves. 
There is an ordained method by which God does what he does in the earth. And if we're not submitted to him, you'll see it by the lack of, lack of submission to men. You just don't know the boss I have. You just don't. Here's what I do know, the word of God. So you either submit and work it out or find another job. Because if they're the boss and you're not, you've got a track before God to take your place, take my place, because I'm not the boss. And if I am the boss, then i got a responsibility before God where God said you're under authority too, and you got, everything's about submission. But God does things through an ordained, prescribed way that we're either in line with him or we're out of line with him. But God's desire is that in our lives we recover all. Everything the enemy's taken, everything. And we stand up if the Lord tarries is coming and we leave for our children and their children and their children things that they would not believe what it was maybe back in the past of the spiritual battles and the things where the enemy tried to get into detour destiny that we would be everything God's called us to be. How many know just something like a bad attitude can keep us back from the destiny God has for us? Just a bad, and the world says, oh, it's okay. God says, it's not okay, and I'm working to get that thing out of there. Because I don't want you passing that on to your kids, and I don't want them passing it on to their, their kids, and I don't want them passing it on to their kids because I've called you to raise up a godly heritage, and I've called you to pass the anointing of the Lord, and I've called you to pass the truths of God, and there is things at stake why we need to stand humbly, surrendered and submitted before the Lord because it matters how we live. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia and from there they sailed to Cyprus. So the Holy Spirit sent Barnabas and Saul out. And he worked through the church to do it as they were there before the Lord, ministering, praying, fasting, and God was moving in the earth and he was using his church to do it. How many believe God's moving in your life in the earth? And how many believe he's got you in the church so we're all doing it together? And he's moving us somewhere and he's taking us somewhere and he's doing something. How many know the Lord is helping us? He's helping. How many say he's been helping me my whole life? Verse 5. I'm sorry, go down to verse 12. Do we have that up on the board? Go back it up, if you would, to verse 5. And when they arrived in... Can't see, is that a D? Sadamus, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John as their assistant. Now, when they had gone through the island to Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was... Bar Jesus, who was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man, this man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elymas the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him and said, Oh, full of deceit and fraud, you son of the devil. How many know that would kind of get people ill at you? You enemy of all unrighteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So somebody was working to pervert the straight ways of the Lord into something else, and they were a child of the devil. And this is going on, and God is using the church to deal with things in the earth as the gospel's been preached and people are coming to Jesus. And now... Indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, and it wasn't in a good way. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, and immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. 
So the teaching of the word of God, people coming to Jesus, then signed wonders and miracles following the preaching and teaching of the gospel. Somebody was sent that the devil assigned to try to break away this man from hearing the gospel. And the Holy Ghost moved upon Paul and said, this is what I want you to say. And the hand of the Lord came upon that man as God began to bring judgment on him and his eyes become dim and he could not see. Does that sound like a familiar story with anybody else we've read about in the Bible? Saul had went through the same thing from the Lord himself. And the Lord struck him blind for a season. And he was in the darkness and the bitterness and the anguish. And the Lord let him, what it, what, let him know what it would be like if he just moved his hand from him. Because how many know even out there in the world, the Lord had been with Saul? Because the Holy Ghost, he fills the earth and you could not have peace if it was not for him. There would be no joy if it was not for him. There would be no laughing. There's no laughing in hell. There would be nothing of love and hope of anything good if the precious Holy Ghost wasn't filling the earth so we could have it. And so the Lord allowed a day when he said, Saul, I want to reckon with you and it's time to now give account. And Saul was knocked to the ground. And what happened? He had a mist come over his eyes and he could not see. And he was walking in a place where he felt like he was completely locked out away from God. But he was calling on the Lord and saying, Lord, who are you? And what do you want me to do? That's when he began to surrender and submit his will to Jesus. And his life began to change. But he went through some stuff. Because the same way he had persecuted and had no use for the church and wanted to take the church and end up putting the church out of commission and thought he was big enough to walk against the Lord, the Lord had him for three days. He didn't need. He wasn't doing nothing. He was cuddled up in a corner. You say, how do you know so much about it? Because I went through it. And the Lord showed me this is what Saul went through. It's what he put me through. And he'll jerk the slack out of you to let you know you don't want to go to hell. Wise up and submit your heart and your life to me and let me show you what I created you for. And as he sat calling on the Lord for those three days, humbling himself before the Lord and saying, have mercy and calling out to Jesus and saying, I believe in you and I repent of my sins. Then the Lord spoke to one in the church. And what was his name? Amen, Bible church. I know you all. And as he came and he said, I want you to go to him, Saul, because he's a chosen vessel and I want you to lay your hands on him and I'm going to heal him. And you remember the man argued with the Lord. I don't know if you really understand. I, you know, I, I think you do know it. But just in case you forgot it, this man's a bad deal and I don't want to go talking to him. And the Lord said, you go. And the man went to him and he said, Brother Saul, and he began to recount to him as the Lord showed him what happened. And he said, he sent me to lay my hands on you. And the hands of the one he had persecuted and had no use for and thought the churches was no use and no value and all of those people, all of a sudden it took one of them that Jesus said, I'm going to use you. So his eyes are opened again and he can see and he'll know that I've called him with me and for my people to take this gospel out into the world and do everything that I've called him to do. How many know God is helping us get it in line? How many believe he's helping us get it in line? And it's not always in the shout and the dance. Sometimes it's cuddled up in the corner. But how many know it takes all of it? Because repentance precedes salvation. Amen, somebody. Look at somebody and tell them, I'm glad I've gone through some of the things I've gone through if it taught me to honor the Lord. Now you remember the story in Acts chapter 9 where that Saul, when the Lord knocked him down on that Damascus road, and Saul said these words to him, Who are you, Lord, and what would you have me do? Who are you, Lord, and what would you have me do? How many know those are big words? I said, how many know those are big words? Who are you, Lord? And what would you have me do? Do you know most people live their life without ever having those answers? 
Who are you, Lord? I want to know you, really know you. Savior, Lord, Redeemer, Healer, Prosper, Protector, Sustainer, Deliverer, everything, the great I am, my all in all. I want to know you, Lord, from my salvation and on. I want to know you. And what do you want me to do? What is my purpose? What is your plan? What is your assignment? And only by your grace and your mercy and your goodness can I get it done. So it's going to require of me that I walk with you steadfastly, solid, disciplined, surrendered, in service unto you every day of my life so that I can stay on track. And I trust you, if I get out of line, you'll get me back in line. Because those that he loves, he chastens. How many been disciplined growing up? And the Lord said, now nobody, when you was going through discipline growing up, you liked it. Nobody said, oh, I think this is wonderful. <laughs> but it done a work, didn't it? Don't do that no more. <laughs> I can't figure everything out, but I know this. Mama said, don't walk that way after school anymore. She didn't tell me everything, but she told me enough. How many know the Lord loves us and he will chasten and discipline us and bring correction to us because he loves us and he says, that's the wrong way. I've got to get you in the right way. And how many are thankful for that? How many are thankful for that? Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. I'm just kind of taking us through a travel in the word where we can see with Saul and the early church and in our lives how that the Lord's called us just like he did those before us to do a work for him. And you may know this. You may just be coming into the things of the Lord and saying, hey, this is all new. We may be anywhere in the middle. But how many know the same way we eat steak, we'll have it again? And how many know we'll need protein again? And we'll have it again. That's the way the word is. We just keep getting in it and just stirring in it and stirring in it. To all of a sudden we notice we don't think the way we used to think. We don't believe like we used to believe. I'm coming into Jesus and becoming more and more like him. Amen. Galatians chapter 6 verse 15. But when it pleased God, Paul talking to the church at Galatia, telling, him, telling them his personal testimony. But when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with, confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and remained with him 15 days. But I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. He's given his itinerary. He's given his resume from the past. He's saying, this is how things happened in my life as the Lord came to me. Because everything in my life, I realize now from the beginning, he had it mapped out for me. And his desire was for me to come to him, to serve him, and to follow him, and then to fulfill his plan and purpose for him in my life. And he's telling the church at Galatia the same way, how many know that's the Spirit of God through Paul bringing us the Word of God? So the same way the Lord done that in Paul's life, look at somebody and say, the Lord's done that in your life. The Lord's done that in my life. He's done it in our lives because he loves us. And how many know we've got an individual responsibility with the Lord and we've got a corporate responsibility with his family, with his body. We are the body of Christ and members in particular. So we need one another because we all don't have the same call, the same function, the same assignment, the same anointing. And if we stay in our lane and do what he's called us to do, it's going to be glorious for us individually and for his church and for the world he loves. But how many know when we start getting crossways out of lanes and don't know who we are or what we're supposed to be doing, then things start getting messy in life. Amen, somebody. Come back to Paul, he's, who are you, Lord, and what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? 
Say to somebody, if you would, set it in order. Tell them, say, set it in order. Get it in order. The scripture says in Colossians 3, 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Whatever we do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Father through the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would get the glory and we would see the good. How many have a testimony in your life? How many have testimonies in your life? How many know when things get tough, we want to rehearse our testimonies? Because we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And do you know if the devil can get your testimony for you to be quiet about it, he can start taking ground in our life. So do you know one of the ways that we start to understand the devil's really trying to put some pressure on me to move me. He starts to try to get us to shut down about everything the Lord has done. Now I'm going somewhere because I feel like the Lord wants me to just kind of stop with that. What did David do when he came to Ziklag and it was all burned with fire? He encouraged himself in the Lord his God. He had a testimony. He had a place where God had been doing a work in him for a long time from just that little ruddy shepherd boy out there in the field and the brother saying, ah, oh, that's just, and daddy saying, well, I don't know about that youngest one. And David just out there singing and dancing before the Lord and just saying, Lord, I love you and God using him and God doing something special in his life. And David encouraged himself in the Lord. He remembered when the Lord called him that day and put him in front of all of them. And the prophet even said, this has got to be God's anointed. Eliab, this is the, str the strong to talk and David he's David's not even in there. and he looks and said this and the Lord said man God don't look like man Samuel I don't see it the way you see it I look on the heart not the outward appearance how many know the prophet got some training and how many know he said is there any more and he David and he come how many know David had a testimony he had a Goliath he had things in his life that he built all through his life testimony Testimony, testimony. But where he was at at Ziklag, he may not have had everything, but he had something. His testimony might not have been where it was going to be, but it was where it was at at that moment. And do you know what in part God sent me to tell you today? Use what you got. Quit looking at what you don't have and use what you have. Because you do have something. Everybody's got something. And it may not be as developed as it's going to be on up the road if the Lord tarries his coming. But you've got something to work with of what God's done for you. And don't let the devil take your testimony. But you stand strong in that testimony. And say, Lord, I thank you that by your power and by your spirit I overcame here. And I thank you by your power and by your spirit you called me out there and devil I come to tell you today the door is open get up out of my house you have no place here amen how many know there's a place that the Lord says I'm not you're not waiting on me I'm waiting on you give no place to the devil give no place to the devil and the Lord's talking to us there through Paul again about the understanding of spiritual things and don't hold unforgiveness. Because if you get in unforgiveness, you're going to end up giving place to the devil. Look at somebody and say, get it in order. Set it in order. If you don't deal with it, and the Lord tarries is coming, your kids will end up having to deal with it. And if they don't deal with it, their kids will end up having to deal with it. And so then when everybody looks back, they'll just say, well, you know, everybody said a great, 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 great grandpappy. He sure did just have a bad temper. But how I many know oh God wants somebody to sit and put the stake in the ground and say it stops here? The generational curses have been cut off and the generational, generational blessing of God is upon me and my family and the stake is in the ground standing with Jesus right here and it changes and I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me and I'm in a new DNA, a spiritual DNA now that I'm built in God to do the works of God. Jesus is my Lord. The power of the Holy Ghost is working in me and on me just like I see through the pages of his word and I'm meant to 
overcome, not be overcome. But I've got to do it Jesus' way. And how many know that deals with this little thing called control? And I got to be willing to let go of the control. And allow God to do what only he can. How many know it's called trust? Trusting him even when I can't trace everything he's doing. Or how he's going to fix it. Or how he's going to see me through. Just knowing and believing you'll do it and take care of me Lord. Amen. When I was but just a child. Just a little one. I knew the Lord had his hand on me. Because at 12 years old, for one Christmas, we didn't have much. Mom and Daddy got money after I left. Isn't that something? <laughs> when I was at home, it was pinto beans. What are we having for dinner? Pinto beans. What are we having tomorrow night? Chili? Out of the same pinto beans? <laughs> after I got out of the house, we had money. So I started visiting a lot because there was a lot of food to eat and stuff like that. But when I was little, 12 years old, it was a Christmas. And as a kid, just real disheartened because I knew we wouldn't have much under the tree. And so my mama told me, she said, we're not going to have a lot this year, but you'll have a few things. So I got a Bible and I got a pack of Lifesavers. You know those books? Not just a pack, a book. Anybody remember those? So I was, as a kid, thinking, you know, I, there was things I'd like to have, but I looked at that Bible and had my name on it, and I had my lifesavers, and God visited me, and I did not know until years later what he'd done in my life. I started reading that Bible, and I thought, boy, I started highlighting, and all of a sudden, just the presence of the Lord would be in my room with me, and I'd have my Christian music on, because Mama didn't let us listen to nothing that wasn't Christian. <laughs> I mean, no good mamas will keep the music out. They don't need to be in there. So I had my B.J. Thomas, Christian Greatest Hits, on the little eight track. <laughs> because you didn't turn on the regular radio, because if mama come in there. <laughs> so I had my Bible. I'd been in church my whole life. Had my Bible started, and the Lord started visiting me, and I started studying that Bible, and I'd get me a lifesaver. And I'd study that Bible and I'd get that lifesaver. You know, I didn't learn till later how the Jewish people taught their kids. And how they would take kids and they would read them the word. They'd read them God's word. And they would put honey on a slate rock. And have them lick that honey off the slate rock. Teaching them. Bringing the connection spiritually and soulishly. The, the honey on that slate rock. God's word is like honey. I didn't know at 12 years old. All I knew was we was Poe. <laughs> but do you know God will work with you wherever you're at? And his plan for our life, there's no devil in hell can stop it. And I began to seek the Lord and I got away from the Lord through my teenage years. But the Lord brought me back in. How many know if you're looking for some of your lost loved ones to come back in, God knows exactly how to reach them to bring them back in. He's done things in their lives that they may not even know how to explain. But one thing I can promise you as we pray, he's working. And he don't reach everybody the same way, but he's got some way to reach everybody. He just needs us to pray and believe him. So when the Lord brought me in, my testimony, he brought me in. And I was out just living in the world. Just thought I was, you know, doing my thing. And one particular night... We were at odds, and I thought I just had the world by the tail, and I was a business man, young and arrogant, and just what God had done in my life. And, just, and I called Christy, and I said, I won't be home tonight, and I'm going to go check on some things and do some work and things like that. She started crying. The old uh, uh, outside phone days, phone booth days. And so I called, and she started crying, and she said, honey, please come home. And I said, oh, quit over it. And, and how many know you always got an excuse when you want to make excuses for things when you're not taking your responsibility? And she said, I want you to come home. I want you. And I said, well, I'll be there, you know. But it, and all of a sudden I noticed when I hung that phone up, I took about two or three steps. And all of a sudden it's like a wind blew, but it was not a natural wind. It was a spiritual wind. And I felt like hell was overtaking me. 
And I couldn't get up out of that place fast enough to get back home. And when I got home, she wasn't there. Because she had said, you made your last phone call. Long story short, God had mercy on me. He extended grace to me. And this is what she told me when I talked to her. I asked the Lord to allow you to feel what I was feeling at that moment. And I asked God to let you feel it. She told me, she said, I prayed and I asked God, save him or deliver me from him. How many know sometimes you got to get strong with your praying? I said, how many know sometimes you got to get strong with your praying? Because the Lord's called us to come out from the world and be separate. And do you know sometimes it takes serious praying to get a hold of God and to get a hold of his heart on a matter to pray even through the toughest of situations and God will come through and he'll do it. And God began to deal with me and he began to show me. Because how many know when you're in the world you can think you're a good husband and a good wife and good this and good that. But how many know God sees the full total record? And how many know we can be sadly deceived? And then when God opens your heart and your mind for you to see just how utterly disgusting you was, you sit in sackcloth and ashes before the Lord and say, God, have mercy on me for my attitude. God took me to a place to where he had to bring me. We was at a Perry Stone meeting. And Christy came to the altar to begin to pray. And Perry Stone prayed for her. And the word of the Lord came to him. The gifts of the Spirit began to operate. And he said to her, as the gifts of the Spirit, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, there's been words spoken over you that are like tears in your soul. The power of God was so strong. We was both crying. We was like about to fall out. I was standing there next to her and couldn't do anything about it because I had done it with my mouth. And he said, I see like tears in your soul from words that's been spoken over you. Even back to your childhood, he said. And we went home that night and you know what God done at the altar? He continued to do as we walked in our house and through that night in the days to come, just like little kid, we sat and cried before the Lord as he healed our heart and healed our minds and healed our lives. And do you know what? He taught us to do different. You know, he'll teach us to do different. And I had to sit and understand damage I had done because I thought I was all that, but I wasn't. How many know pride will blind you? And lies will bind you. And God, by his grace and mercy, was delivering me from lies and deception and setting me free and setting my wife free and, and setting our family free to be able to go do the things he's called us to do. How many know we've got a testimony when we walk with the Lord? Don't ever, ever let the devil take that testimony. Because what he's done in your life, somebody else needs to hear it. What he's done in your life, somebody else needs to hear it. Because if he's done it for you, he'll do it for them. And how many know he'll do it by his power? God connects us not to everybody, but to somebody. And there's an anointing. And you know, we've been connected with Perry Stone all through the years ever since then. Because God used him in a way in our life that God changed our life through him. And we're forever indebted and thankful to the Lord and the man he used in our life. Amen, somebody. I felt the Lord wanted me to stop the message at that point and share test some testimony. How many are here today and you believe God is saying to you, I want you to recover all. Everything you've lost, everything the enemy's stolen, taken, everything that God wants you to have back, he wants you to have it back. And how many know more? Because it's not just what we have, but it's what God is doing for us in our future that's out in front of us that we don't even know is there yet. 
But we got to be willing to take the steps now in obedience and honor unto the Lord to get where we're going because we have to pass the test. How many believe you're in some testing times? Some trying times? Some tough times? And God has called you not just this battle, but the battles to come in transformation to be different. To think different, to believe different, to be different in what God's called us to do.